Good evening, and thank you for attending this lecture as part of Historic Preservation Month, which officially starts in May. This is also part of the 150th celebration of Spencer that we are celebrating this year. The lecture, Second Stories, is presented by Kirby Schmidt. Kirby is a wealth of knowledge, as we all know, and um, was a previous uh, city planning uh, department head for the city of Spencer, and also just has a lot of really great building history about the city and has led countless number of tours downtown specifically. A special thank you also to the Spencer Chamber, the Historic Preservation Commission, Spencer Municipal Utilities, the City of Spencer, the State of Iowa Library, and the Clay County Heritage Center. Thank you and enjoy. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, Sharifa, for that. Um, so we're gonna start. I'm going to um, uh, have um, a little presentation first, a little, a little dialogue, So, and then we're getting started. So. The information used in this presentation is a collection of various articles found in the Spencer Reporter, the Spencer News Herald, and photographs accumulated by the city of Spencer, as well as data extracted from the 1921 and 1945 R.L. Polk and Company City Directory, uh, Spencer City Directory, the 1972 Johnson City Directory, the 1971 Spencer Centennial Book, the 1984 History of Clay County Book, um, one thing to mention uh, while we go through this is the 1921 city directory uh, used the old addressing format that does not transfer easily uh, to today's addressing. So uh, for an example, um, in 1921, we have addresses from 409 to 495, 14 addresses on the one block. So it's, you go, you try to figure out which address goes to which building. So. Um, Anyway, and also the 1921 doesn't specifically say what is upstairs. So it's kind of a interpretation as to what might be up there. So anyway, the years 1921, 1945, and 1972 were chosen because they represent three distinct eras in the history of the downtown business community. 1921, 100 years ago, is at a time in our history when Main Street has been filled in with business buildings from the river to the railroad depot. Um, 1921 is a time in which we see a push to replace many of the, many of the original wood frame buildings with more substantial brick structures. And this year uh, can also be used as a means to observe the type and number of business firms that have chosen to occupy the second stories within the downtown business district for the convenience of their clients. 1945, which is 76 years ago, illustrates the second story commercial uses in a post-1931 fire community. In 1945, the country was nearing the end of, the, of World War II. Private businesses during the war were forced into a holding pattern until the end of the hostilities. Rationing was the most, uh, of most consumer products was the norm. And so that, uh, so what has changed in the downtown since 1921 and what has stayed the same? And are there more opportunities to live in an apartment downtown? 1972, 49 years ago, we see fewer businesses occupying the upper stories. 1972 was a time in our history when there were more opportunities for some of these businesses, business firms, to locate in areas outside of the downtown. Consider all the new commercial development south of the bridge or along Highway Boulevard to the north. 1972 was just prior to when steam heat was discontinued for a large number of downtown buildings. And when, we, um, when, the, steam heat discon uh, when the steam heat discontinuance was announced, building owners had to make a decision whether to reinvest in their properties to continue to be able to offer commercial or residential second story rental space or was the writing already on the wall because of the economics, reduced demand, and accessibility issues? Today's tour will commence on the east side of Grand starting at 7th Street and proceeding to 3rd Street and then return north along the west side of Grand ending at the Tangney Hotel. This area incorporates the majority of the Spencer Downtown Commercial Historic District. So we start at 600 Grand, the Asher Motor Building. In 1921, the Asher Building was a single-story structure. In 1930, 
the building was enlarged and a second story was constructed that was used for automobile display and sales. About this same time, Mr. Asher sold all or part of his interest in the auto dealership to Rush Smith. Mr. Asher pur purchased it back sometime later. The second story floor display, the second floor display and sales use was continued until the Asher Motor Company moved to the south side of Spencer in 1972. So, corner building was the Asher's. This represents a pen and ink drawing taken from 1928 showing the original building, and as you'll see, the, um, I don't go for it, always. Where is it? Not working. Okay. So the corner of the building is open. That is a post. You will drive your car underneath that corner of the building to get your gas. That's a recessed entrance there that you could drive through to get your car serviced. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, 1930, there it is on the top. It's filled in, the big plate glass windows are up there, the corner's infilled. So, and that's just being done because there's actually a photograph uh, that I didn't use that actually has a car transport in front and the windows aren't even in yet. So, they're in home of Rush Smith Motor. So it's changed from ashes just for a while and then it goes back. Back to 28. Okay, so the next building we're going to talk about. Ah, ah, ah. I love technology. Okay, the pool building is the next one. It's the second one, which is now the Pizza Ranch. Um, 530, and in 1921 it was 550. Uh, a two story building was constructed by Ralph Poole in 1923 for Case Automobile Sales and Service. A second story contained seven rooms and a bathroom, which could be used uh, a, for a large apartment or for two small apartments or offices. The 1945 directory lists the pool clothing store on the first floor and two apartments on the second, one of which was occupied by Ralph Poole. In 1972, one apartment was listed as occupied. Period photograph of the pool building. So here's the story. So Sadie Heard, daughter of Leslie Hurd, the next building, married Ralph Poole. Sadie owned Poole's, the clothing store, a highly respected women's clothing store. Ralph worked at the post office. Sadie and Ralph's daughter, Imogene, married Bob McDonald, who opened a children's clothing store in the south half of the building. Okay. Now we go to the Hurd building, which is the tall one here. 528 Grand, the Hurd Building. A two-story building was constructed in 1915 by Leslie Hurd to replace a wooden frame structure. The first floor was used for an automobile garage with the second floor for rent. This building survived the 1931 fire. The 1921 directory does not list a, a second floor use. 1945 shows the second floor occupied by the Glenn Hurd Real Estate Company and the Clay County Farm Bureau Insurance Company. In 1972, there were four businesses upstairs, Ryan Givens and Company, the Rental Credit Company, and the offices of Wayne Hurd and John Campbell, and they were accountants. Uh, so the next are 524, 520, 516, 514, and 5 grand are all single-story struct single structures. And we'll go to the pre-fire. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I missed it. So there's the Hurd building. Um, during the fire, you, there's smoke is coming up, but this is where it, it's, it's still surviving. Everything else south of there went away. Uh, Pre-fire 500 east side. There you go. Um, this is a really fun picture. I just had to put it in. I know it's all about single-story buildings, and all those buildings that we talked about earlier are still single-story buildings before that. You see a lot of automotive use in this area, especially on the east side. Uh, before these, they were lumberyard buildings and other wood frame buildings, but mostly um, livery, and then the livery converted to garages with the automobile. And so that's what you're going to be seeing. So Moore's livery was Ewing's. If you ever hear of a Ewing uh, livery, 
or Ewing Motors, that's where that building was, and, and the Moors bought it and, and converted that. Another fun, uh, really old picture, 1918. Uh, this is probably looking from 6th Street, at, uh, maybe even 7th, 7th Street looking south. Uh, you can see the reporter building on the corner there. Look at that. So there's the reporter building on the corner. And of course, these are all the wood frame buildings that are gone now. So now we're up to the, to the arcade building. And this is what it looked like in 1928 when Asher remodeled it into, again, car sales and display and the, for the sale of access car accessories too. So notice how the facade is still the same above the arcade. That upper, that upper band, um, I believe, survived the fire. I think we've got some pictures of that where it actually survived the fire and got rebuilt around that. Okay, so now we're on the south end of the 500 block at the corner of the, for the Moore building. So 508, 512, excuse me, I'm sorry. The next one north is I'm going to stop doing this. So there's, there's the, the floaty Cornwall building. Again, post fire. Uh, no listing for 21. 1945 lists the Federal Order of Eagles Lodge, and 72 has no listing. And then the 504 is the Grand Theater or the Solon Theater, single story. And again, there's the Solon, pre-fire, very ornate. And then the next building is the wood frame building that is going to get rebuilt after the 31 fire. Mm -hmm. So 27. So you were there? Go. Solon is, what's there now? Is that where the theater was? Yep. Just the top. Same spot. So now we're on the corner, 500 grand, the Moore Building, 1931. The 1921 shows numerous buildings at this address. F. A. Moore, which I think is Fred. Uh, excuse me, Moore and Sons Real Estate. H. L. Steg, H. S. T. E. G. E. He's a broker. And I'm going to butcher this. The Alivero, A. L. I. O. V. O. L. I told you I'd butcher it, confectionery. And it doesn't list what's on the second floor, so the confectionery might have been on the first floor. Uh, 1945 shows five occupied apartments and the Mariposa Beauty Shop on the second floor, including Mrs. Fred Moore's residence. 1972 shows six occupied apartments, including, again, the residence of Mrs. Fred Moore. On the next, so now we're on the north end of the 400 block, the Redfield building on the corner, which is 420, 422 grand. Um, originally constructed in 1915, rebuilt in 1931. 1921 directory as the R.S. Brown Insurance Company, L.R. Gartland Optician, G.L. McClanahan Dentist, J.A. Redfield, uh, his, his residence. And in 1945, uh, four apartments. In 1972, the Spencer Industries Foundation and four apartments. The next one is the Smith Knight Building, which is the bakery. And that is 416, 418 grand. Uh, also built in 31. In 21, uh, the original building had C.J. Coder is a dentist. 1945, Mrs. Merle Nielsen Beauty Shop in three apartments, and in 1972, four apartments. The next building is the Grand Opera House in the Gla Glass Block building, which is this one. And 1921, again, numerous uh, persons up there, but no information as to the main level or the upper stories. Uh, I, I like this one, though. Ethel Boyd it was an osteopath, so we see a female doctor in 1921. Clay County Fair Association, C.E. Golly, dentist, Ida M. Jordan, music teacher, Spencer Commercial Club. In 1945, the directory lists the Equitable Life Insurance Company, the Farm Loan Department, of, excuse me, the Farm Loan Department of the Equitable Insurance Company, Glenn McClanahan, dentist, W.H. 
Clenderdine Dentist, Northwest Federal Savings and Loan Association, Thomas Thomas Insurance Company, the Public Loan Investment Company, Keith Thomas Insurance Agency, James Burrington Real Estate, James Fisher Insurance Agency, New York Life Insurance Company, BK Blackwell Real Estate, PJ Clear Real Estate, PJ Clear Real Estate, American Mutual Life Insurance Company, Spencer Adjustment Bureau, and the Credit Bureau. Busy place. Um, just as a note, James Fisher uh, was one of the insurance people up there. He moved to Spencer in 1914, opened a life insurance agency, which evolved into a general insurance and realty firm. He was very dedicated to the improvement of Spencer, and he served on various boards and organizations. And he developed both the Fisher and the Fisher Court subdivisions, uh, generally described as being between West 9th Street and West 11th, from 5th Avenue West to 7th Avenue West. In 1972, the Community Credit Services, J.R. Getting and Company, Kenninger, Galvin and Associates, and one apartment were upstairs. Now we're on the south end of the 400 block, and on uh, the, the, so the Fraser Theater is right there next to the glass block. And in, it's 406, 408 Grand, also built in 31. 1921, the original building had the Great Western Accident Insurance Company, Royal Union Mutual Life Insurance Company, and one apartment. In 1945, we had four apartments, and in 72, we had two occupied apartments, including William Flint. 404, excuse me, 400, 404 Grand, which is the large, that it is, you gotta love that building. That's a great picture, too. The Nicodemus Building, originally. In 1921, E.E. E. Bender, the mayor, was up there. E.W. Wagner and Company, brokers the Paris Hat Shop, A.W. Laird, physician. And in 1945, we had eight apartments, and 1972, eight apartments. So obviously, we went from a commercial use pre-fire to a residential use post-fire up there. Now we're pointed at the 300 block on the north end. Uh, go ahead and just change it to the city hall one. Yep, that's OK. So there is the original two-story building on the corner pre-fire. Actually, that is a from the fire picture. So people gathering to watch the fire. And that's the building in the background. It was also the People's Savings Bank originally. In 1921, a second story is not listed. In 1945, it was City Hall, the mayor's office, police department. And the uh, Stitz brothers, barbers, were in the basement. And Edward Bender, uh, clerk at the post office, was in an apartment. And Charles Bender, Clay County Treasurer, was also living in an apartment there. In 1972, it had been converted to a single story building. Next building would be this one, which is 328, excuse me, 320 grand. And 1921, Ole Knutson, a tailor, and I don't know if he was on the first floor or the second floor. Uh, 1945, the Ideal Beauty Shop and four apartments. And 1972 was also four apartments. 318 was the next one to the south. Um, 1921, Mrs. Alma Peterson was a milliner. 1945, we have one apartment. In 1972, an apartment occupied by Newell and Peter Redman who most likely was renting the space underneath. Redmond Shoes. Uh, 316 is the Hughesman Building. That's the one right here, right next to the alley, which I believe is the brewery now? The Hughesman Building. Uh, in 1921, F.L. Kingdon, photographer, and again, he could have been downstairs in the first floor. 1945, an apartment. 1972, an apartment. south end of the 300 block. And we're gonna be talking about the woman shop next. There it is without any vinyl siding on it from the period. Um, 
But again, they're all single story buildings from 312, 310, 308, 304, 302 are all single stories. So I don't have much to say about it except there's a really nice period a photograph of the south half of the Huseman building and a really good look of what the, the woman's shop looks like without uh, any vinyl siding or the transom glass covered up. Okay, we've got to the other side of town. And I haven't used an hour up yet. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're at the 300 block looking north and the union block, 301, 303, 305 grand. Uh, in 1921, the J.W. Fisher Insurance Agency was up there. J.P. Goebel was a lawyer and four apartments. In 1945, there were three apartments occupied and in 1972, there were seven apartments occupied. Now we have a neat old picture. So the fun story about this is that that is the original union block that burned down in 1916. Look at the round windows up top and on the side. But if you were to go out in the alley, you can see round top windows in the alley. So the whole building must not have burned all the way down. They rebuilt the front more modern with the square top lintels on the, on the, on the windows on the second floor. But it's, it's got a similar brick design up there. It's not, it's not the same exactly. It's not rounded, but it's still got that. It's not a protruding cornice there. So. Do we have another one of that? Yep, there's the difference between them squared off, but very similar. Okay, the next one is the, because the, the next two are single stories. I kind of skipped over them. And now we're, yep, now we're at the Gala building, the Woodcock Gala building, built in the, um, in the early part of 1931. Um, So I don't have much on this except that, let's see, 1921, it burned down a, a building. Well, the newspaper says a building built in around 1870 burns down in October of 30. And the current building was constructed in early 1931. In 1945, there were eight apartments. And in 1972, four occupied apartments. And I have some fun pictures, old pictures of this. So there is the, the, the wooden structure that burned in early 1930. Excuse me, late 1930. And there's the new building, brand new. And look where Redmond's is. They're on the other side of the street. And they're just moving in. OK, we're back to the street. And we're going to talk about the Hastings building, uh, built in 1919. And 1921, we don't have a listing at all. And in 1945, it lists Hastings building and Gala apartments together for some reason. I don't understand that. Because they list the Gala apartments, but they list the Farmer's Bank address. So it's something was messed up there. And in 1972, it lists Elsie's on the first floor and no listing on the second floor. Now we're going to go to the Farmer's Bank building on the corner. And in 1921, upstairs, again, it's a really busy place. Uh, J.P. Lippold is a dentist. The Sextant Real Estate Company, Smith and Went Contractors, P.J. Silly Investment Banker, C.C. McCullough, McC Collister, sorry, physician, Buck and Kilp Kirkpatrick, lawyers, Clay County Abstract Company, J.E. McClurg, auctioneers, and the DeWolf Grain Company. In 1945, rooms 1 through 10 were C.C. Collister, M.D., Claude Baldwin, lawyer, and Clay County Abstract listed together, Clarence Bittinger Insurance. So, um, Dr. C.C. Charles Chapman Collister joined in practice with his father, J.C. Collister, in 1912. 
They rented rooms located at 3rd and Main, burned in 1916, think of the Union Block fire, and they relocated to offices to the west of the Bernstead Drug Building. The younger Dr. Collister was licensed for both general practice, general surgery, and optometry. Many might recall the story of Dr. Collister upon hearing the fireworks exploding at the start of the 1931 downtown fire, presumed the noise as gunfire from a bank robbery downstairs, drew a gun from his desk, left a disrobed male patient in the exam room in order to curtail or stop a bank robbery, and upon returning to the exam room, found the man's clothing, but the patient had left. <laughs> Gotta love that story. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, here we are. We're looking at the south end of the 400 block looking north. 401, 405, also listed as 409 in 1921. The McAllister block, also rebuilt in 1931. In 1921, we have the R Northern Rural Telephone Company, Cornwall and Cornwall Lawyers, Iowa Securities Company, Spencer Loan and Abstract Company, Standard Oil Company, Western Electric Telephone System. In 1945, again listed as 401 to 405 now, Edward Davis Insurance, Moulton Moss Insurance Agency, Gilbert James Lawyer, Cornwall and Cornwall Lawyers, Spencer Loan and Abstract Company, Robert Miller Insurance, R.C. Mickletree Real Estate, Dorothy Maris Mariski, Public Stenographer, National Loan Association, Federal Land Bank, Security Acceptance Corporation, Olga's Beauty Shop, and the Iowa State Department of Health, American Red Cross. In 1945, Cornwall and Cornwall Associate, eight, excuse me, attorneys includes Dean T. Cornwall, R. Morgan Cornwall, Wendell W. Cornwall, and Wilson Cornwall. In 1972, Bankers Life of Nebraska, Equitable Life Ins Assurance Society, Iowa State Department of Health, Knit and Pearl Shop, North Central Adjustment Company Incorporated, and the U.S. Treasury Department, IRS. Now we're going to move down to 407, the Clay County National Bank Building, the tall one, the really, really good Art Deco one. In 1921, D.W. Bettis, dentist. 1945, Jesse Crosser, barber, was in the basement. R.R. Mater, chiropractor. Nathaniel Usland, chiropractor. Violet Beauty Shop, Charles Philgraf Dentist, A.M. Walling Dentist, Chris Peterson Insurance, The Moyer Loan Service, Mrs. Faye Tripp Real Estate, oh, I gotta love that one too, uh, Banker's Life of Nebraska, Investors Syndicate, County Agricultural Conservation Association, Agricultural Adjustment Association, and in 1972, we have American Red Cross of the Iowa Great Lakes, the Iowa State Area Social Service, Mallory Realty Company, Minnesota Mutual Life Insurance Company, and the Woodman Accident and Life Company. So with all those dentists up there, it had to smell like alcohol, right? <laughs> and here's a really good view of the pre-fire at 4th Street looking north. You can see the uh, McAllister block, the original McAllister block over there. You can see the original First National Bank, which was the Clay County National Bank. The, the strange thing is, so in 1920, um, Medler builds their new building. They just get moved in. Frank Medler dies. Medlers were in the third floor of the bank building. Um, and you can see Khan Studio on that thing. Khan didn't move in in 21, but he was there in 22 because I found a thing in the paper that said he moved in. So it must that third floor must have been vacant for that one year that we chose this, this particular uh, directory. So we missed that one. But Khan was up there for quite a while. Um, 411 Grand is also a single story. Once you go back to the 
we don't have that to number 11. Yep. Yep. So there's the 411 Grand. It's where the the um, Kunath building, it's where the fire stopped on the west side. That one survived. Um, the next one we're going to do is the JS Painter Block, which is the IOF Hall, which is 413, 415 grand, uh, built in 1891. Uh, Mr. Painter uh, was to build the lower floor, and the International Order of Odd Fellows agreed to construct the second floor and the roof. And the second floor was used for that purpose in 1921, 1945, and it was vacant in 1972. The next one is 417 grand. Um, I can't remember who's in there right now. That's the nail salon. That's the the Mexican restaurant. Okay. Um, the, and I do have to admit. It gets really complicated right in here with the spacing of the doors on the original buildings. They each have their own door going in. Like there's a door there, there's a door there. I think there's a door there. The addresses get really complicated for me to try to figure out who exactly is where. So I'm not saying I'm really accurate there. So 417, 1921 lists a C.S. Graben physician at 457 Maine. Also, a Mary Jones residence at 489, and the Owl Club also at 489. So I know that the Jones family had a grocery store in one of those two buildings, and it makes sense to me that that the one we're talking about right now, she would have lived there because if that metal comes off, there used to be a bay window on the second floor and the Jones family lived there. So it makes sense that that's possibly the 489 and the Owl Club was somehow in there too. What is Feldman's Well, but didn't Feldman's move one store too? Because didn't they have, they didn't have that one? They had, yeah, at one time they had, so Feldman's was this, when I was a kid, that's where Feldman's was. But I also understand that Feldman's was in that for, for a time too. So, yeah, and that's the, that's the really bad part about reading old newspapers because they'll say John Smith's grocery is in the such and such three doors away from this guy's building. And it's like, <laughs> and of course, they're all trading buildings. That I need more space or I need, I, you know, it, it, they keep moving around. So it's, yeah, it's really hard to figure out where everyone's at. So... Um, in 1945, there is no listing. In 1972, there's no listing for 417. Uh, 419, uh, the last, uh, again, I wrote down, the last two listings that I just gave you could have been in that building too because it's really hard to figure out which. It gets a little bit easier on the next one, which is the Krauss building, which is um, the Squire Shop. Um, 421, H.W. Krauss building built in 1913. Uh, 1921 lists the Guyot and Green Barbers at 491. 1945 has the Paramount Beauty with an E on the end instead of a Y uh, salon at 421. And 1972, it lists two apartments. 1923, Grand, the Haygarth building, the one on the corner. Uh, 1921 lists N.S. Dyer Real Estate. And 1945, Clarence Coder Dentist. Richard Fair, optometrist, and George Haygarth, a lawyer. George Haygarth established his law practice above his father's drugstore building. William W. Haygarth built it and remodeled it. And in 1972, all we have up there is Claude Baldwin, an attorney. So now we are on the north end of the 500 block on the west side, and we're going to start talking about the Citizens Bank which is the one on the corner, and work our way this way. I don't have a really good picture of that block looking north, so we're going to do it from that way. So 505, 501, Grand Citizens National Bank, 1921, uh, Heald, Heald and Cook Lawyers, T.H. Johnston, Physician, E.E. E. Munger, Physician, Red Cross Home Service Company, and the R.W. Reamer Dentist. 
1945 as Clara's Beauty Shop, Waldo Solholm Dentist, Bowman Business Supply, Albert E. Munger Physician, E. E. Munger Jr. Physician, and in 1972, no listing. So Dr. E. E. or Albert Irvin Munger Sr. came to Spencer in 1885. He practiced in Spencer for 50 years. His son, Dr. E. E. Munger Jr., joined his father just prior to the Depression and continued to practice medicine in Spencer for 20 years after his father's death. The younger Dr. Munger was greatly interested in pathology and as it related to more accurate diagnoses for his patients. He had also received training in blood, blood transfusions and Dr. Munger Jr. retired and moved to Arizona in 1969. So we got, there is the original 501 with the turret on the corner and that building is still there, it's remodeled the terracotta tile got put on and the turret got taken off. They remodeled it. And we've got news articles about when they did it and how much it cost. So you want to do the next one? And there's the newly remodeled one, except for the really old cars, so you know it happened a long time ago. The upstairs windows that are really cool, they've got, so they've got a vertical mullion and a horizontal, and they've got diagonals on all those windows. It is to, if we were to ever get those, those unboarded and fixed up, they're just going to be spectacular. Next building, 505 Grand, the Moore Birdsall Building. 1921 lists the Central Hotel torn down on 1922 to construct the current building. A news article in 1922 states that there were there will be two offices in the front and a lodge hall in the rear. And my father told me a long time ago, there was a dance hall up there, the, the big band, Champagne Bubbles. Thank you, Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk played up there, my dad said that. And then he helped Evert Roskins remodel it and he said it was really hard to drive nails through that hardwood floor, the dance floor. So they made offices up there. So, and now it's uh, two apartments, right? So, in 1945, we have the Flugum Dental Laboratory, George Heald Jr., lawyer, Thomas Vint, office, John Birdsall, real estate, Earl Moore, real estate, Tyrell Insurance and Auto Finance Company, John Lippold Dentist, Spencer Reminder Shopper's Guide, Clay County Selective Service Board, and in 1972 we have Maury Preston Insurance, excuse me, Maury Preston Agency in Insurance. So to, to go back to 1945, uh, William and Agnes Flugum came to Spencer in 1931 just after the fire and established the dental laboratory specializing in dentures. Upon their retirement 40 years later, their laboratory equipment was shipped to Madagascar and they followed to the island in order to help set up a lab and to train the Malagasy people to operate a laboratory themselves. 24, thank you. Again, we're back to this. So the J.L. Frank building is the one we're gonna do next. That is I gotta get that right. That's the one right there. Oh, I take that back. We're gonna go one more, one more south, right there, that one. 509 Grand, built in 1922. And there is no listing for 1921. In 1945, we have Ethel Boyd, osteopath, the Frank Apartments, the owners, and one, in 1972, we have one apartment listed. Uh, 511 is the Wilsey building right next door, built in 1919. There's no listing for 1921. 1945, the Lovely Lady Beauty Salon. <laughs> the Francis Rustard Osteopath, now we have another one, and one apartment. And in 1972, we have two apartments. And the 513, 515, 517 grand are single stories in the middle here. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but we're going to move on to the Hanson building. 
519 grand, built in 1948. The second story of the earlier building was used as a residence for the Hanson family. The 1948 building was also constructed, but as configured as a two-story dwelling for the Hanson family. We have a couple neat old pictures of that. There's the original two-story from Ole, the, fa the father. And the, uh, you can see the wooden building on the, on, on the south side that was replaced. And you can see the night building, which is going to be the next one, uh, on the north side. That was torn down. Go ahead. And there's the new one that we have today. Again, the windows up there represent the two-story apart, a uh, two-story dwelling. It's a full-blown dwelling up there, and I had the opportunity to, to to do a tour last year for the downtown tour up there. That is a really, really neat place. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 1948. Okay, we've worked our way all the way down to the to the. F.W. Knight Building. Uh, I don't have a. I don't have a year on that. Why did I not do that? Uh, 521 grand. So 1921 list. E.W. Bailey, Leslie Brown, F.W. Knight Real Estate, Spencer Light and Water Company, and that actually could be on the first floor. I'm not. I'm, most likely it is. Uh, 1945. There's no listing for the second floor. And the Green Brothers Barbers are in the basement. 1972, it lists one apartment. Now we're on to the 523 Grand, which is the reporter building, right on the corner, uh, built in 1913. It has no listings for both 1921 and 1945. And in 1972, it lists two apartments. So there is a photograph that was taken during the Depression by the federal government to keep photographers and artists busy during the Depression. And it's a, that, that actually came from the Library of Congress. And that's what it looks like with all the brick and the, and the windows and the recessed door opening. And that fire hydrant is still there. <laughs> and now we're to our last address, 601-605 Grand Avenue, the Tangney Hotel, built in 1921. Started in 1920, completed in 21. There are no businesses that I know of above the main floor, but several other businesses in the building that I thought were kind of interesting over the years. 1921, we had the N.E. Driscoll Confectioner, William Ellis Barber, Harris Brothers Bus Line, J.W. Uncle's Billiards, and in 1945, we have the Driscoll Candy Company, Couch and Green Barbers, the Tangney Hotel Coffee Shop, Bus Depot Lobby, The Gift Shop. In 1972, we have Eddie's Coffee Shop, Burroughs Corporation, The Cellar, The Fireside Inn, Greyhound Lines, National Cash Register, Orkin Exterminating, Scenic Hawkeye Bus Lines, Spencer Answering Service, and the Tangney Hotel Barber Service. There's when it was just four stories, and everyone was proud about it. And way on the left side, you can see the remnants of the Erling that were used, I believe, at the time for the family of Tangney to live in. And we're back to the old photograph of downtown. There's the courthouse. There's the Erling. There are a lot of wooden stores. <laughs> there is the Citizens Bank with the turret on it. Oh, I'm okay. There's there's like four churches, right in this clump around the courthouse. They're all gone now. But if you come to the to the lecture about development, I've got pictures of the churches and I can prove where they were because I've got another picture from the opposite direction looking at a bare courthouse square when they're getting ready to build the courthouse in 1900. So the, the postcard is not as blurry, but it's still pretty vague. So it's a long time ago. So, okay, I haven't used up an hour yet. So 
we got time for question and answers, or questions. You can pose questions or statements and hope to get an answer. <laughs> So the question is, how did they get the cars up on the second floor at Asher's? There was a ramp. They drove them up. And they drove them up for a long time. Another thing, if you go down to Godfather's Pizza, that used to be Holmes Motor Company. That was Ford. There was an elevator, a rickety iron and steel cable elevator. They would pull cars up to the second floor and do body shop and mechanical work on them. Elevator. Yeah, go figure. Oh, you guys are too easy. I don't have to add some money. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. You mentioned the mural authority several times. You also mentioned the people with burning buildings. Is that something someone would have been bouncing as you went from one place to another or more formal? You mean like like Fred Moore on the in like five hundred and then he's over on, on five oh five? I think that's the same Fred. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he might have lived on the east side and worked on the west side of Grand. His office is over there. Yeah. It's, you know, think about us. How many times do we actually document stuff that goes on right now in our lives? It, we don't do that. You know, you start asking questions like, how old, how old is the jail? We built a brand new jail here just a while back. How old is that? Probably near about eight or ten years old. The swimming pool, the aquatic complex. We don't we don't write stuff down. But when you go back and look, you go, gosh, there's a date. That's that's been way too long ago. Same. This uh, the, all these guys trading stuff around. It just was constant moving around. It's yeah. You just can't keep up. So, well, thank you for your time. Hopefully, uh, no one fell asleep. Oh, we have another one. Oh, the steel? Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the slides that Brad Howe saved from being thrown away and re-sleeved them, there is a parade picture. It's a full-blown picture of the front of that. It's kind of a reddish-brown brick that had been painted white, and all the white paint was kind of scrubbed off, had a little antique look. had a white frame bay window, and it was during a um, crazy days. I'm pretty sure it was the reason they were taking those pictures because it was crazy days. The, the, it's either that one, that group of slides, or there is a binder at City Hall that has n pictures from like the early 70s that I believe um, Don Bartlett took, and they're in a, in a folder, and it might, be, it might be in that folder is where that picture is. But yeah, yeah, so obviously they, they whacked the bay window on when they put the metal. When they put the metal over the front, they had to get rid of the bay window. So. Is she the same Feldman? No, I asked. He had married into it. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. In Stephen's building, or was it the north half of, of the bakery building? Well, it was where the Indy Brewery was there. West Shore and Stephen's. Yeah. West Shore and Stephen's are the same thing. Yeah. And then there's the Indy Brewery and the Indy Brewery. Okay. So, but Candy Brewery wasn't in the north half of the bakery building. It was still in the south yes. chunk of the, of the Redfield building. I think the West Okay. I just remember the big golden goose, yeah. plastic golden goose when I would. <laughs> Anything else? If not, I'm going to ask Nancy to come up because she wants to have a little time to talk about her thing. And we'll get uh, Sharifa back up. So we're hosting our fifth annual downtown upstairs tour on Saturday starting at Sisters Cafe for cinnamon roll coffee and juice at 9 o'clock 
and then we'll send people out the door at about a quarter to 10. We'll go to five locations. The only one we're repeating um, this year is the Brown, so we'll go to the International Order of Odd Fellows upstairs there. We're gonna see the Loft by Prest. It's the premiere of that place. It's right above Prest. Um, we're gonna go above Sp where Spencer Sewing was in the Union Block. They're doing construction there, Aaron Tekken and his group. So the three apartments up there are getting renovated. We're gonna go across the street to Quail Law. And we will also go into Betty Flint's apartment above the Beehive, Beehive, Beehive and Grand Bridal. So if you want to go, I've got tickets, or you can sign up online, or you can just show up uh, any time between 9 and 9.45 at Sisters Cafe on Saturday. 20 bucks. Well, I would like to thank Kirby for taking out of his time to pull all of this together. Um, I don't think you probably had any fun doing it. Um, <laughs> I secretly know that you used to uh, lock yourself in the library and do microfish research. He's going to deny everything. No, I so in. I, they gave me the key. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, you locked yourself in. So, and thank you, Sandy, as well for all of your help. And um, again, to everyone that that helped to make this possible, especially to SMU for recording it and um, for all of the technology that's provided here at City Hall as well. Um, so this was the first of five lectures. Uh, that the Historic Preservation Commission put together. Our next one, and we do hope that you can join us in person or through Facebook Live or watch it um, down the road. Uh, the topic is Inventors from Spencer, and this is a fascinating one. Um, Tom Howe, who is a member of our commission, has actually taken this uh, on and doing a bunch of research. So we will hear from family members of those that um, had inventions right back here in City Hall in the Council Chambers. Um, also, to, fi to find the replay dates, you can look at the Chambers Facebook page, the 150th Flag Fest Facebook page. We'll make sure and share it out on that, and also the Historic Preservation Commission Facebook page. Um, and so that's on Thursday, May 13th at 5.30 here. The next one is Who Was George E. Spencer? And um, the speaker for that will be Steve Baumgars, and that's on Tuesday, May 18th, same time, same place. The following one on Thursday, May 20th, uh, is regarding family businesses in Spencer. And I know Kirby talked a little bit about some of those, or you heard some of those names tonight. You'll be hearing them again during that session as well on May 20th. And the final one um, that Kirby is also going to be helping out with is on the development of Spencer. So when community gets established, how do they start making streets and where do they decide where certain things are going to be placed? And um, so Kirby and Jim TC with Cruz Kate Nelson will be our speakers that evening. And that's on Tuesday, May 25th, also at 5.30. So we hope that you can join us, again, either in person or through Facebook Live or watch it on replay as well. And if you have any questions, you can call City Hall at 580-7200 or the Spencer Chamber at 262-5680, and we would be happy to help answer any of your questions. So thank you very much again. Thank you.